All right, five minutes after 11 o'clock. It looks like it's getting to be a hot day in Ocala. Right now, it is. Let me give you, oh, 86 degrees. My gosh, it got hot in the last half hour, didn't it? 96 is the expected high today, so. so. And it's going to be that way all weekend long, by the way, so. Go find a swimming hole or someplace to cool down. Connie May Fowler is our next guest. She's on the phone. She's an award-winning novelist. She adapted uh, Before Women Had Wings into a film for Oprah Winfrey that won an Emmy Award. She's the director of the Connie May Fowler Women with Wings Foundation. Uh, and she's on the phone to talk to us about her book titled A Million Fragile Bones. It's a memoir that details the beauty and peace she found on Alligator Point after years of heartbreak and loss and the devastation and upheaval that followed the Deepwater Horizon BP oil spill we were all familiar with here in Florida and the entire Gulf Coast, correct? Yes. Uh, Connie May Fowler, what an honor to have you on our show. Good morning. How are you? Good morning. It's great to be here. Thank you so much. Where are you calling from? I'm calling from Cozumel, Mexico. Cozumel, Mexico? How is it down there? Yes. It is fantastic. Oh my (laughs) gosh. yeah, the weather reports are beautiful. It's you know in the low eighties and a nice sea breeze and oh it's my paradise. God. That must be yeah. beautiful. Do you live there or are you vacationing? Uh, no, I, I moved here about a year ago. Really? Do you speak Spanish? Yeah, I'm getting better at it. <laughs> <laughs> I used to I used to know how to order scrambled eggs in Spanish when I was in South Cal- Southern California, but <laughs> now I forgot. <laughs> Well, that's the first thing you have to do is, is speak restaurant Spanish. <laughs> restaurant Spanish, <laughs> yes, yes. Restaurant <laughs> Spanish is awesome. Uh, well, thank you for being on there. A Million Fragile Bones. Explain the title. Well, the title has a few meanings. Um, one, as you alluded to, i would had a very, very violent childhood, and as those cycles tend to do, that followed me into adulthood, and I finally rose out of that but had basically a lifetime of, of pain to heal from. And nature had always sort of been my balm, and I gravitated to that isolated little spit of land into the Gulf of Mexico called Alligator Point, where at the time when I moved out there, there was almost no one there. And I really lived a kind of idyllic life, just immersed in nature, and it's where I healed. So the bones refer to that. The bones also refer to all of the wildlife that died as a result and continue to die as a result of the oil spill. And also the fact that fossil fuels really are sort of the liquefied bones of, of dead animals. Oh, I mean, that's really yeah. what it is. Yeah. yeah. That's what they say, yeah. Oh, wow. So you, the, the shack that we were talking about is up in the panhandle? It's up in the panhandle, right. Oh. It was built by the U.S. Army in the 1940s. It was an old Army barrack. And when the Army took... Uh, after World War II was over, folks from Tallahassee came down and bought them and renovated them. So it was an old army barracks. Were you were you um, were you there by choice, or, or I, I'm a little bit unsure about what happened to you? Well, I no, I, I went there by choice. I I was driving around. I was supposed to go do some gig. I think in Pensacola, and I saw. I was going down Highway 98, and I didn't know there was anything like that still left in Florida. 98 is still pretty pristine Florida. And I got to a road that said Alligator Point, and I'm like, well, you got to follow that. Yeah, really? <laughs> and, um, <laughs> as I did. I want to see it. I want to go there. Oh, it was fantastic. I mean, I know it's built up more now. I haven't been back since I left, but, I, um, but it's still wonderful. Um, and the windy road in the Gulf of Mexico was on the left, and Alligator Harbor was on my right, and I came to that kind of holy sign that says, for sale by owner. <laughs> and oh. it was this ramshackle group of, of buildings, and, um, and sure enough, one of them was for sale, and uh, I bought it and lived a wonderful life there for, for 20 years. Um, I mean, there would be some days that the only person I might see would be the mail lady. I didn't have to see anybody at all, if I didn't want to, um, I really just lived among wildlife, and it was fantastic. You are, you are describing yourself almost as a, the stereotypical description that you might hear of a writer, and, and <laughs> I don't want to be presumptuous, but is that do you think that might have contributed to the reason why you enjoyed that lifestyle so much? I think it absolutely it did contribute. I mean, you know, I think all writers need us isolation. I teach, and one of the 
um, concerns my students always have is, you know, how do I find not only the time but the place to write? Because, you know, you've got kids in the background, you've got the husband changing channels, you've got the phone ringing. And so Alligator Point really did allow me that solitude to truly immerse just in my work. So you, you, you hinted at it earlier or said earlier that you were ab- abused in your younger years. Were, does that include your childhood? Were you abused as a child? Yes, had a very abusive childhood. Oh my gosh! And, and how did you get through that? How did you survive that? Uh, I really think it was through two things. One, because anybody, any child on this planet needs unconditional love, and with any kind of luck, they're going to find it somewhere. And if it's not your parents, where do you find it from? And I found it in two places. At least I interpreted it this way. I found it with my stray dogs and cats and and all the wildlife that I could scramble around. I was always dragging home stray animals. I had uh, squirrels that would follow me around and eat out of my hand, you know, one of those things. But I felt like they accepted me, you know, where I wasn't being accepted anyplace else. And then truly through books, I mean, books saved my life. You know, in books I found role models. In books I, I figured out that not everybody lived the way we did. I found out that there was, you know, something better out there so it's those two things that that helped me survive it and i will say i had some really great teachers truly great teachers were, were your teachers always in person or do you do you mean like virtually like through books uh no surely the i had teachers through books but you know i went through the hillsborough county public school system and had just some of the best teachers anybody could ever wish oh, okay. for okay okay Ac- actual teachers then okay yep actual teachers so, and how is life for you now? And and it sounds like in twenty years you healed. It took twenty. Did it take twenty years to heal, or or was that just you just didn't want to leave? Well, it was definitely a process, you know, of healing. And no, I didn't want to leave. I mean, I really, really loved it there. And then the oil came in and really destroyed everything. And for me, you know, maybe because I'm a writer, or maybe I'm oversensitive but I don't think I'm alone in this. Alligator Point really became sort of my sacred space. And, you know, I, I planted everything for all the migrations that came through. I planted food for the, for the butterfly migrations. And you watch these butterflies come across the Gulf. They have been flying across the Gulf of Mexico, and they just land, just sort of collapse on the wildflowers. That's their first sustenance they've had in days. So I became kind of this caretaker. I would plant for them. I would plant for the hummingbird migrations, put out seed for all the other migrations. So I really did feel like, you know, we were part and parcel of the same natural organism. And then to see the oil destroy it was really bone-breaking. Yeah. um, Yeah. I don't know if I should tell you this or not, but Robin and I are, are children's, act, or we have been in, in the past, a children's recording act. We did music for children. And when that happened, we did a song which was kind of uh, leaving the children's genre because we were trying to make a point and keep it adult. And it was called We've Got Balls. And, and <laughs> the, 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 the song was about We've Got Balls on the Beach. Made of made of tar. Tar. Yeah. yeah. Oh goodness yeah. gracious! A- and it was because yeah. they, because they were. I mean, you could you could go to uh, Yankee Town, which is a, a coastal city not too far from here, right. mm-hmm. and mm-hmm. you would see these little balls of of tar or oil or yeah, whatever. They were awful. And and the the press was interesting during those years, wasn't it? Because I I, I was trying to figure out who was really telling us the truth, especially up in the area you were near the Panhandle. It seemed like you had the worst of it up there, um, and yet the press was contrary. Um, one one news agency would make it seem like there was nothing going on, and another news agency would show like the worst of the worst with the birds covered with oil, and and so I couldn't know. I couldn't know as somebody who did not travel the entire coastline what the truth was. But I but I trusted the photographs. I mean, it looked like there were really bir- right. birds covered in oil. Well, that was one of the reasons that I, as difficult as it was to write the book, one of the reasons why I made myself write it was to tell the truth, I mean, and to bear witness to what was happening, because very clearly, as it was happening, those of us who were living through it realized that BP and the government didn't want anyone to know. Yeah. What they wanted to do was disappear that oil, prevent you from taking pictures. That was the sense. They wanted their PR spin, and those of us who lived through it really felt like we were being corporate ga- gaslighted, and I think we were. I mean, it was like, we're living this, yet you're telling us we're not. I went for a walk one day on the beach, and suddenly I'm in 
knee deep into this weird muck and it it takes me a moment and then I realize I'm walking through oil mousse which is highly toxic and it's also full of the corexit the dispersant that they sprayed and so I, I get back to the house and I scrub off and I turn on the news and there they are saying there's no oil on any Florida beaches <laughs> right I just right. walk through it oh my <laughs> gosh yeah and see that like I say in Yankee Town, it wasn't the way you're describing it, but I saw the photographs and I trusted them. And now hearing you tell us that, oh my gosh! Uh, you had said there are also dead baby dolphins that were washed up on the beach. Oh, really? Yeah, that you know there were as the days went by, you know the water got darker and heavier because it got more filled with oil. And at first, the dead animals that would come ashore would be baby fish. And crustaceans were some of the first to, to get the, the effects. For one thing, when they started spraying the Corexit, that made that didn't make the oil go away. It's still in the environment, but it broke it down into such small particles that the Corexit and oil became perm, uh, membrane permeable. So it just, I mean, it's really incredibly toxic to all the systems of the, of the wildlife, but it hits the shellfish first, and then it went up the food chain, as it were. And so then the, the bigger fish and the turtles and then the dolphin, and in one of my most heartbreaking moments of my life, and by this time I am about out of my mind with grief and worry and disbelief, I see a baby dolphin in the surf. And I think maybe I can save it. Wow. This is it. One one thing I can do, and I run through all that junk that's in the water, and I get to the baby dolphin, and I hold it, and it dies in my arms. Oh, my oh. gosh. Um, the, the book is called uh, A Million Fragile horrible. Bones, and uh, we're starting to get a better understanding of, of the book itself. Uh, it is written by Connie May Fowler, who is down in Cozumel, Mexico, mm -hmm. enjoying that place. I thought we were in the beautiful place. <laughs> I, know, I know we are, but so are you. Uh, so the one thing, and this is like an environmental debate at this point. Um, if we, as the United States, decide not to drill in the Gulf of Mexico, for oil then other countries will and they and they actually do already because part of the gulf of mexico is international waters so it's it's almost like the whole world has to get on board this if we're going to do this we have to do, all do it i don't know what your thoughts are on, on that well let's be clear bp is not an american company bp is british petroleum but they had the right, they had the license or whatever, right, right? from, from but, but so, so the American government gives leases right. to these companies. And so, so there has, has never been any offshore drilling off of the state of Florida. And in fact, there was a movement in the state legislature to allow it um, in the months before the disaster happened. And we were, a lot of us were on board trying to stop it. And in retrospect, how naive of us because there are no state boundary lines, physical boundaries in those waters. No. You know, th this thing happened off the Gulf of Louisiana, but it, it tainted the entire Gulf sure. of Mexico. Sure, yeah, yeah. Yeah, well, that's what... And so, uh, and now the new administration is proposing leasing 73 million acres off Florida, Alabama, Texas, Louisiana, and Mississippi over five years starting in August. So, you know, at that point, I believe you can kiss the Gulf goodbye. And, well, and the argument to that is that if the Trump administration al uh, didn't allow that, other countries would still do it, even though they they wouldn't be in in the off the coast of Florida necessarily, but they'd be in the Gulf, and the Gulf Stream would carry it everywhere. I mean, that that's the part of this that that's, that's kind of the part. I, I believe in the Gulf of Mexico, you you've got three entities with rights to drill, and, and and they're drilling in different areas. Mexico in the Bay of Campeche and, uh -huh. and some other places. They start, and they are drilling. Cuba, I don't know if Cuba's drilling. I think they are, if my memory serves me correct. But the rest of the Gulf of Mexico, those are pretty much American territorial waters. We decide who drills. You know, you can't, you know, somebody from, you know, Aramco in Saudi Arabia can't just come in and start drilling. Well, it's not I, like there are international waters in, in the Atlantic. But, but off of the coast of Mexico, they can. Off of, like, right, where, where also, you are. Yeah. 
Right. And in Mexico, they have tried to sue in American courts, the fishermen have, because they feel that their fishing grounds were also ruined because of the BP oil spill. And the American government said, you have no rights in our courts. Were there? Uh, it was so. It's it's so refreshing that you have written this book about this, and that you've stuck through all these years. There were some people that just gave up, had to close their doors, and move to other states because their area of livelihood was gone. But yet you persevered. Well, no, I, I actually uh, two things happened to me. Um, one one of the ways I made a living was to hold writers' conferences. And I had my conferences at Cedar Key. And when the oil spill happened, I had 100% cancellations. Oh. So my business was destroyed. And the other thing that started wow. happening was wow. my health started being affected. Um, and I have ended up with some very, very strange respiratory issues. Oh, I've really? had pneumonia four times. My doctors say it's a chemical uh, because I was exposed to Corexit. We're finding more and more people in the Northern Gulf Coast are having uh, health effects because of that exposure. Most, you know, far more severe than mine. I just have to stay away from certain chemical agents. Mm -hmm. But um, no, I had to leave for my for my health and for I, I couldn't conduct any um, conferences in my own backyard anymore. People wouldn't come down. Yeah, there was a, there was a lot of. Um Oh, how do you say it? damage control? That's a good way to put it. A lot of damage control yeah. from the tourism industry and the seafood industry mm -hmm. because people were going away uh, from the the Florida caught shrimp, for example, because they were afraid that well, it was going to be tainted with the oil. Um, yeah, that, that well, and I feel terrible for those people. I mean, I remember going to my my fishmonger and I walked in and he burst into tears and I'm like, what? is going on as if anything else could get worse and they had sent a, a truck full of seafood up to the new york market and they they wouldn't even let them in they just sent them back you oh. know but the facts that you know and i don't want to affect you know anybody's livelihood you know the fishermen have been through so much but the fact of the matter is you know there's the scientific data is is coming is finally starting to to um, come to the fore and you know the gulf is not in good shape the wildlife is not in good shape do you know um, we have uh, some people we hold up because of the great work they've done and it's always been through words and um, I think you are among them the the lady who's responsible for the for the um, canning of the idea to build a, a, a canal across the state Marjorie, mm -hmm. Marjorie Carr, Carr Mar Har Harris, Marjorie Carr? Harris. Carr. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I mean, I mean that—that's the kind of work you're doing. You, you did some uh, writing regarding the sugarcane industry in the Everglades, right? Yes, I did. And so that's another issue that we somehow nipped in the bud before it got to be too bad, and and hopefully that's going to be corrected. Um, I, I hope. That's. It, I hope it's so complex. I mean, I, the work I did in the glades—it was a long time ago. Um, but what, what Big Sugar told me very simply was, we own the land. The government asked us down here, we own the land, and what are we supposed to do? Right. They said, if they make us stop, stop harvesting sugar cane, cane, we can build golf courses and condos. <laughs> so oh, I mean, yeah. we have a huge, yeah, 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 we have a huge problem. It's yeah. like, well, how do we buy them out? How do, you know, it's just... We, we're still paying for some really bad decisions from many, many years ago. Well, anyway, I, well, I guess what I'm trying to say in my awkward way is that thank you for what you're doing. I, I think you're contributing. Well, you're welcome. You're contributing to the same types of things as Marjorie Harris Carr is what I wanted to say. So, the, so oh, that's a huge honor. This book is called A Million Fragile Bones. I think you're making some really good points. To, to have somebody with your talent in, at writing and, and the, the ability to convey to us information that didn't get to us properly back in those years. I, I mean, I think that makes a big difference, especially for all of us who sat through that and said, "Well, what is the truth?" Yeah, you know, it depended on where you went. If you, if you, I mean, if you looked at the news, that's one thing. But if you personally uh -oh. saw balls on the beach, like Robin and I did, and, yes. and you tried to do your part by by singing a little song about it, you know, it didn't it didn't even make a wave, let alone a, a ripple. So. Um, I, I love the fact that somebody of your stature has, has taken up this, even if it is a few years later. How many years ago did this happen? 
I can't remember. The, sev- the seventh anniversary just passed. It was April 20th. Okay. But I tell you what, and this is one of the reasons why, even though it took me a while to write the book, in part, I think, because it was, you know, it was very, very painful, and I wanted to get it right. I did a lot of, you know, I knew what I was living through, but I also needed to wait until some research came out so that I wasn't just blabbing. Gotcha, I wanted, yeah, yeah. I wanted to, you know, have the facts, and this is, and I think if, more than anything, I want people to understand this. This is an ongoing disaster. What, you know, what is um, dolphins are still? You know, the numbers of stillbirth are astronomical. Oh, what is core exit? What is that? What is core exit? Core exit is the dispersant BP chose to use. Now, to hear them say it, it's like using Dawn dish lotion, and it doesn't get, get rid of the oil, but it breaks it down into very, very, very small parts. Oh, is that those amoebas or something? Parasites or something? Well, no, what it does is it, um, the Corexit is incredibly toxic and it's been banned in, in other countries, including England, where BP is from. And oil, of course, is very toxic. Combined, they, they create an even more toxic chemical. So they just did everything they could to make this situation worse, except it did make it look like there was no oil. And a huge amount of the oil with the Corexit simply floated to the floor of the Gulf of Mexico. So there was a huge like bath mat of oil and Corexit creating a giant dead zone on the Gulf floor. And as it degrades, it becomes more toxic. uh, But but the worms and then the amoeba and everything eat that, and then that goes up the food chain. Yeah, yeah. The the, uh, trials and tribulations you went through when you were younger, I'm so sorry you had to go through them, but I think the the lining in the cloud, as they say, is the strength that you are displaying right now. I think the strength that you have is because of those those crazy times as much as they were hard to get through i think they made you a stronger person and and um i think that's good for all of us because you're writing some wonderful books uh this one is called a million fragile bones let's see did i put it on the on the video yes i did if you're watching the streaming video i have a cover of the book on the video um so we need to find out how to buy it let me ask you this first connie do you have a website I do have a website, ConnieMayFowler.com. ConnieMayFowler.com. And is the book, I'm guessing the book is on Amazon and all the other places? It's on Amazon, and you should be able to order it from your bookstore. It's, it should be everywhere, and if they don't have it yet, there was a glitch because uh, orders are more than what they thought. Thank you, everybody. <laughs> yeah, really. <laughs> <laughs> but, we, but we think we've solved that, so the books are moving now, so... And uh, this is, and and what you're doing isn't just for our country because you are writing for the world. Your your work has been translated into 18 different languages. Uh, you write for the Japan Times, the uh, uh, London Times. So there are people all over the world that are paying attention to what you say because they don't want that to happen to their community. Well, thank you. I think that's right. You know, people really don't want it to happen in their own community. So. So, but you know, we, as, as you all have been saying, when you don't know it, it's, you, what are you going to do? You can't do about anything about a problem you don't know exists. So maybe by speaking out, we all start, you know, making a sea change. I just went to your website and I'm reading some of your your blog as you're talking. You are an outstanding writer. Thank you so much for being on the air with us today. Um, again, the book is called A Million Fragile Bones. Connie Mae Fowler, F O W L E R. Go to her website, ConnieMayFowler.com, and you'll see the website and uh, go buy the book. And and uh, and thank you so much, Connie. And oh, wait a minute, you have a dog named Ulysses. I saw that on here. I do. A, a dog named Ulysses, Robin. <laughs> oh, that's a good title for an- another book. What was the name of that dog on, on the poster True. we're doing? What was that dog's? name we're doing it we're doing a fundraiser here we have a dog on it what's it called oh i can't remember the, the, the one that was yeah, in jail the one in the prison suit yeah, yeah. the one in the prison suit. goliath goliath okay goliath. Goliath. <laughs> all right, all right. I, I was just all right connie thank you uh enjoy, enjoy cozy mill come back to florida sometime i i will i'll be there soon and thank you so much i really appreciate this thank it's you been a pleasure we'll be right back thank you News Radio, I'm Karen McHugh. Lawmakers working to pass a spending bill by midnight. This is a short-term fix that gives lawmakers another week to pass a bill keeping...